Um, Linton, I'm going to ask you to take it away with five minutes, and we'll just go right down the line, and then we'll start our conversation. Okay, so I'm the token practitioner in the sea of academics, uh, and so I'm going to need this for the. I'm the token practitioner in the sea of academics, and I'm going to focus on this really from that perspective. Strategic stability, vast subject, um, and we will explore different dimensions of it. But one of the tools we use to get it is bilateral arms control. Uh, for reasons associated with mutual acquisition, of, uh, uh, mutual accusations, of non-compliance with existing treaties, it is almost certain that the treaty that we have now with the Russian Federation will be the last arms control treaty for probably a decade, maybe forever. And so one of the more urgent tasks on strategic stability is to figure out, so what? Arms control is supposed to help strategic stability. We're not going to have this tool strategic stability is right now in a difficult phase. So what is it that we ought to do? Uh, and the answer is clearly, I don't know yet, but we ought to think about it. We ought to sit down and figure what is it we really give up if there are no arms control agreements. We give up a lot of transparency we give up a cap on the arms race. We give up an area where Russia and the United States can work together as equals, which is important to any reasonable definition of stability and particularly important to um, the Russian leadership. We give up uh, a tool to show that we are paying attention to our obligations under the Non-Proliferation Treaty. So we ought to sit down systematically and figure out what else we give up. And then we ought to see how we can preserve some kind of stability without formal arms control. If you go back and you look at a seminal book called Strategy and Arms Control by the late Tom Schelling and, uh, and Mort Halperin, uh, their concept of arms control was much broader than ours. It included everything that was cooperative. It included informal arrangements. It included military and military discussions. It included treaties. And we've narrowed that over my professional lifetime to just mean legally binding ratified treaties. But that's not the only way we can deal with the Russian Federation. So. Let me paint you a picture of the post-arms control world. Maybe we don't have an arms race because maybe the two sides have an informal agreement that will stay at the current levels as long as you do. And maybe they've each made a speech before the United Nations uh, to say that. We still have transparency because the treaty mandates transparency, but if the treaty goes away, it doesn't forbid transparency. We can still exchange all the information we exchange. Now, maybe we even have reciprocal visits. We don't call them inspections because that sounds too treaty-ish, but we know how to do that. We did that for years under the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program to give confidence that what we were telling each other was was true. And that was one way. So this would be bilateral and would be much better. Maybe we work together on some initiatives in areas we can agree. Control of fissile material, uh, enhancing our efforts in nuclear terrorism. And that demonstrates our ability to work together 
uh, and respect one another as equals, which is part of any, may not be part of any formal definition of, of stability, but it's part of any real world uh, definition of stability. And the problem that I have now is, I've, what I've just given you is some very rudimentary thinking that I've done personally. But this is an area where all of us are smarter than any of us. And so we need more people to be thinking about this and coming up with more ideas. And we need to use the time we have left before this treaty goes away uh, to begin to socialize those ideas with the Russian Federation. Thanks. Uh, th thank you. I feel like I should begin with a comment about metaphors. Uh, this is the third occasion since March that I've been uh, on a panel discussing U.S.-Russia strategic relations with some droning, pounding so noise. Uh, Not emanating from the panel itself. <laughs> well, we, we excel at that on our own. But, uh, and, and, it, and it is something of a metaphor, which is uh, the real world keeps moving while, while we try and get our thinking to catch up. And that's been really obvious on, on this general topic. Uh, as our strategic relationship with Russia has changed, uh, our concepts have been slow, slow to change. Uh, and the real world just keeps hammering away at us. Uh, and I, I think in this, in this area, at least, we're playing catch up uh, intellectually. <clears throat> I thought I'd just stick to the question of change and continuity change and continuity uh, in U.S. policy approaches to strategic stability towards Russia. Uh, and, and to try and answer a simple question, which is, is the Trump administration in the mainstream or, or, or not uh, on the question of strategic stability with Russia? And my, my, my answer is yes, no, and too early to tell. Uh, and uh, I think that's an accurate answer. And, and let me make all, all three cases uh, briefly. Yes, it's in the mainstream in the sense that there's really no heretical idea that the Trump administration has set down about a change to the strategic military relationship between the United States uh, and Russia. Uh, it has um, not set out a missile defense goal a nuclear goal, a cyberspace goal that relates to fundamentally upsetting somehow the strategic military relationship with Russia. And indeed, it has expressed continuity of purpose in the nuclear posture review uh, with prior policy approaches to Russia. So that's, and, and it's uh, expressed uh, a, a, a somewhat half-hearted but, but ex expressed a commitment to seek arms control measures despite all of the circumstances that, that Linton hinted at and we'll talk more about. Uh, the administration has sought continuity in, in arms control with, with Russia, with, with albeit low expectations of achieving that. So that's the yes in the mainstream. Uh, no, uh, not in the mainstream. One, they very much downplayed strategic stability relative to the upplaying that we gave it in 2009 and 2010. Uh, the upplaying had to do with the fact that uh, we were, as an Obama administration, reacting to what had gone before. Uh, and what had gone before was a Bush administration approach, which said to the Russians, you're not our enemy anymore. We don't worry about you very much. Nuclear weapons, let's get them out of the foreground of this relationship, put them in the background. Strategic stability, why worry? Uh, we, don't, we don't consider you a nuclear enemy. What the Russians heard was, my God, the Americans are taking nuclear weapons out of the relationship. This is the most important way that we protect ourselves against their depredations. Uh, so the message that the, just, that the Bush administration was sending wasn't the message that was received. Uh, and we, we tried to put strategic stability back in the center of the strategic relationship with Russia and to say we, we respected that our interest in stability is mutual uh, and we, we, didn't, we chose strategic stability as an alternative to putting deterrence at the center of the U.S.-Russian nuclear relationship. Um, 
clearly the Trump administration has moved away from that. Uh, and it's also put the emphasis on regional stability, as it should. The military problem with Russia, the instability that we encounter today with both Russia and China is not at the strategic level of war. It's the possibility that there would be a regional war in Europe or Northeast Asia uh, that would involve questions, that, that would involve instabilities that we've only begun to think about. So that's the no. So yes, no, and the, and the it's too early to tell answer is, of course, we all recognize that we have an administration that sets down policy markers and a president who follows his own course. Uh, and, and it seems to me that it's quite possible uh, for this president to choose to do things that are completely anathema to the tradition of thinking about arms control and strategic stability. Uh, and you know, one, one of the absolute fundamentals of American strategic stability policy and arms control policy is that there is a faction in the Republican Party that will never allow legal restraints on missile defense. Who are those Republicans and does this president listen to them? Couldn't he, he, couldn't he leave Helsinki next week and say, I've got the right deal for America? Uh, who cares what it does to the Europeans? Uh, and it involves legal restraints on American missile defense. That's what Mr. Putin wanted. Uh, it's a good deal for America. You Senate Republicans line up. Too early to tell. Okay, well, um, I cannot pretend to channel the absent uh, Dr. Wojtolowski from this panel, but I thought that it, it is useful and important to get uh, some ideas of what the Russian perspective on questions of strategic stability is out on the table early in this conversation. And, um, you know, the Cliff Notes version of this can be found in a chapter that I did for a book uh, on strategic stability put out by the Army War College, uh, edited by uh, Bridge Colby and Mike Gerson. So if you don't pay any attention to the next four and a half minutes, you can just look that up online. Uh, plus it's got citations and quotes and useful things like that that I cannot remember myself anymore. Um, let me give you first four basic principles uh, that I think uh, really do characterize Russian thinking about war and peace. Um, and, and bear in mind, right, we're talking about a country of, you know, give or take 150 million people with 150 million different opinions. So when I do this broad brush stuff, I'm talking about a certain set of elite decision makers whose views are by and large influential on Russian policy. So uh, number one, uh, major wars happen, okay? You really can't prevent them, so your principal task is to survive them. That's number one. Uh, number two, the decision whether to go to war or not uh, is often made on the basis of irrationality rather than pure reason and is often taken against the obvious or apparent interest of the party taking the decision. Okay, this is based on Russia's own experience and its study of the experience of others. Um, third, Russia is a unique nation that has a unique place in the canon of world history, especially of Western civilization. It therefore needs a unique mission and it needs unique capabilities to execute that mission. And then fourth, by the way, if, if some of this is familiar to you, fantastic. If it sounds completely radical and foreign, ask me about it in the Q&A. Uh, and then fourth, uh, based on both Russia's domestic internal experience uh, and its observation of the world, uh, those who are weak will be exploited. All right, so these are sort of basic principles for Russian thinking about peace and conflict. Um, what about views of strategic stability? I use this kind of catch-all term. It's a bit glib, I'll acknowledge, um, but I think it works. And, and the term is the great power gambit. I think Russia's essential view of its strategic nuclear arsenal, um, and even, by the way, by extension of its, of its tactical nuclear capabilities to the extent that that can flow into a strategic nuclear confrontation with the United States, is of a kind of gambit, like in chess, right? An opening move that is intended to put you in, a, an, advent, in an advantageous position early in the contest. 
Um, and I think this plays out in two principal lanes of thinking in, in Russia and many other smaller ancillary lanes, but I'm just going to talk about the two. Um, one is focused on Russia's existential interests, right? And this shouldn't be that foreign to us because it's not that dissimilar from the kinds of strategic stability thinking that we know in the United States from the last half century, uh, you know, arms race stability, crisis stability, etc. cetera. Um, and this is essentially that... Uh, if Russia can clearly link the prospect, the risk of a nuclear conflict, to threats to its existential interests, okay, these are, right, so things that would threaten the very existence of the Russian state, then it is more secure in terms of those interests, right? So strategic stability is the opposite of that case, that uh, the situation is stable, uh, that nothing is done that provokes a risk to Russia's existential interests, and therefore that invokes the possibility of nuclear war. And and by the way, some of the terms that have already been put on the table and that I think we'll talk about a lot more, like ballistic missile defense, um, conventional prompt global strike or conventional strategic capabilities, space capabilities, cyber capabilities, and this notion of kind of regime change by various other means, these would all speak to existential fears or risks or interests on Russia's part. Now there's a whole second category that often Americans are tempted to presume does not get to the world of strategic stability, but that for Russians really does. And this is what I would call vital interests that are beyond existential concerns for the Russian Federation. These are status interests that Russia views as vital, in particular in the post-Soviet space uh, and in regions of the world like the Middle East where Russia really values its power projection. Arguably, it, it's casting an even wider net on that today. And I call this something like the, the anti-American bullying view of strategic stability. If you can implicate questions of escalation to nuclear war and attach them to uh, your objections to American behavior, let's say, in the former Soviet Union, then you can, in effect, deter American bullying. Now, these are two very different ways of thinking about strategic stability. And I would argue, uh, uh, Brad just brought up the, the, the most recent um, Trump nuclear posture review, and, and one of the very salient uh, points that's been much debated in the press from that is the so-called escalate to de-escalate Russian strategy. I'm not sure that that term is actually used in the NPR, but I think it's pretty, it is used. It's pretty clearly referenced in any case. Um, my view is that that interpretation of Russia's thinking, that there is in fact a doctrine or, or a strategy called escalate to, de to de-escalate, is not only a misnomer, but it blends these two categories which shouldn't in fact be blended. It presumes that a Russian goal to use the implication of a potential nuclear conflict for protection or pushback against American bullying vis-a-vis -vis its vital interests beyond the borders of the Russian Federation can be uh, directly relevant to the problem of Russia's existential concerns for its very survival. And I would argue that these are two different things, even though they both have strategic stability implications. So for, okay, all right, well, I'll just conclude then by saying this. Um, this is a context in which two apparently contradictory thoughts can coexist at the same time. Uh, one, that seeking to preserve strategic stability in order to protect one's existential interests, and at the same time threatening to upset strategic stability in order to win recognition of great power status and to push back against threats to vital interests, that these two things can coexist at the same time in Russian high-level decision-making. Thank you. Uh, well, while the panel's on U.S.-Russian uh, relations, I'd like to take a slightly different tack and talk about what some of the allies and our partners, in, particularly in Europe, are thinking. Uh, this is based on this project you mentioned that I'm doing uh, for DITRA and some recent uh, studies over there. Most of the Europeans I talk to still believe that the, uh, the best way to deal with Russia and, and its current guys is through NATO. So I'm going to talk about NATO. Uh, and some of the key allies as well. But the lack of a constant message or focus from the United States combined with the president's verbal attacks on allies, which continued apparently this morning in the opening of the, the NATO summit, um, the emphasis on defense spending, the links to trade, all of this has left uh, a feeling of consternation within the alliance on where the United States is going and how to, how to deal with them. 
uncertain what American policy versus Russia really is, or with respect to Russia. Uh, the Europeans want to remain firm and stand up to Russia, but they also want to keep the United States happy, but they have to live with this big neighbor to the east, nothing new there. Uh, several people pointed out that they know Russia is weak in the long term, but this may make them actually more dangerous because in the shorter term, uh, for reasons uh, that you can imagine, we have to worry about how they might respond. Uh, Russia would prefer to debate the West on a multilateral basis, but that's, they aren't willing to talk to us on our terms or on our topics or on our timing. So what we find is that there's a lot of current talks going on, but they're mostly bilateral and they're all compartmentalized. There's not a lot of the traditional arms control negotiations that we're familiar with growing up in the, those of us on the panel, growing up in the Cold War. Um, okay, so what are some specifics? And these are obviously going to be oversimplified characterizations of what I've heard given the time constraints. Uh, generally, as we all understand, the, the countries that are closest to Russia are the most concerned. These are the Baltics, the East, East European states, Central European states like Germany, the uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia are less worried. And the Mediterranean states, such as Italy, where I spent the last five years, uh, don't think Russia is a threat at all. The real threats to them are from the South, instability, migration, terrorism, and what's wrong with NATO that they can't focus on that instead of only on dealing with Russia. So some specifics. Uh, and I welcome my panelists objecting to any of these characterizations I have, but I think and hope they're all right. Uh, Britain continuing to support the strong deterrent. We see that in a lot of their modernization efforts. Uh, they're really upset about the Novichok biological weapons attacks, which has strengthened the resolve of the Brits. Uh, the MOD is quietly continuing track uh, two meetings with Russia uh, on the sidelines through some of their think tanks. Italy, new government since May, has said Russia is not a threat. Uh, this is a view Italy's had for a long time, but they weren't willing to say it until this new government because they didn't want to risk antagonizing the alliance or breaking with the positions. Then they're calling on the European Union for closer ties with Russia. Germany seems to be as schizophrenic as the United States in how it wants to deal with uh, Russia. There's no common threat perception that everyone can agree on. There are some strong hardball responses that are underway by, within the government. Uh, they are increasing their defense spending, but there's also the traditional recognition of the need to keep Russia happy. Uh, very little forward thinking on things like arms control disarmament, which is surprising given that Germany has often had the lead on that sort of thinking in the past. And there are also track one and a half or two meetings going on with Russia on the INF Treaty, for example, by some of the think tanks there. Uh, France, very kind of surprising when we were in Paris to hear that uh, one of the senior, uh, the, the leading MOD think tanks is really worried about making Russia an adversary. They're looking for a partner because they see the long-term challenge to be China, not Russia. And they need a partner they can count on, and they, at the moment they don't think that's the United States, so they want to keep Russia around as a potential partner for dealing with issues from the South and with China. European Union, another opportunity for states to work together in addition to NATO. Uh, energy policy is playing a key role. The door is open, according to Ms. Mogherini, uh, but there are divisions within Europe. Uh, I think one of the best lines I heard is that the European Union is focused on three people, the Sultan, the Tsar, and the Trump. Okay, this is what's driving policy in Europe right now, and you can guess which countries they're talking about. Uh, NATO, and then I'll, I'll, a couple points on NATO, and then if I have a minute, I'll close with some areas for possible cooperation uh, in line with what, uh, what Linton was saying. NATO is the most hardline organization. It was, again, I was in NATO, I was not in Brussels, but going there and hearing the views within the building, uh, other than the Deputy Secretary General, who's working very hard and trying to keep lines open to Russia, most of the building is convinced there's no need or no reason to talk with Russia at the moment. We talk about defense and deterrence on one hand, dialogue on the other, perhaps rejuvenating the Harmel uh, plan from the 1960s, the two-track approach, but nobody is thinking about ways to enhance dialogue. Uh, the NATO-Russia Council is meeting occasionally, but that's about it. 
So again, you're all probably familiar with the multiple programs that have been underway, especially since 2014, to strengthen the alliance, to strengthen its defense and deterrence capabilities against Russia, uh, particularly in Eastern Europe. But there's no comparable emphasis on soft power that I've seen within the building there. Um, one senior member of headquarters said that NATO does in fact have a strategy, even though it's not written down and articulated, and Brad heard this at a conference we were at recently, it's a bottom-up approach, and the strategy is simply gather together a lot of things that we think we need, consolidate them with an unpredictable coalition of states that will use them, and hope that the resulting mix works against an adversary such as Russia. Okay, that's not much of a strategy, but that's kind of what we're doing. Okay, so a couple of areas? Not really. All right. In the discussion, I have a number of areas that, uh, specifics, that there could be a recognition of some common areas of interest, vulnerability, uh, areas worthy of discussion or threats that might be met by working together with Russia. Uh, it may not be the traditional narrow view of arms control that we have today, but it's, there are possible spots. So I'll stop there. Thank you so much, uh, panelists, and thank you for your discipline. Um, so I think what I'd like to do now is throw out a couple of questions to get our discussion going, and then I want to be sure to take questions and comments as well from the audience, so we'll leave plenty of time for that. Um, <clears throat> so picking up on something that both uh, Linton and Brad mentioned, but also tying it into Matt's comments, I'd like to understand a little bit better, um, you know, clearly strategic stability and the perceptions of strategic stability in the U.S. have evolved over time. How much of this is a response to the ways in which perceptions of strategic stability in the Soviet Union and the Russian Federation have evolved? So how much is that sort of a parallel uh, response to what's going on in Moscow? So I'm happy to start and um, uh, be countered by, by others, because my view is our thinking hasn't really changed very much at all. Strategic stability, I mean, it's a, it's a it's a label that's used by many people very imprecisely, but, but fundamentally it's about avoiding steps that bring us closer to nuclear confrontation and nuclear war. Uh, and we, we pretty much have the same set of concerns we've always had. What we have with Russia are fundamentally opposed assessments of what's wrong with the strategic stability equation today. The Russian assessment is, we Americans are the ones doing damage to strategic stability uh, through both, well, and Matt, Matt pointed at, at, at their assessment. Uh, and, and our American view has been, why are you worrying about this? This isn't what we're worried about. You're not the center of our strategic universe, our nuclear universe anymore. And there's been this mismatch in assessments of what the problem is uh, that's threatening strategic stability. But I don't think our basic concepts of st strategic stability have changed that much in, in either capital. Uh, that's probably right. Um, as, a, as a description, it may be wrong as a prescription because um, in some ways we could have had this kind of discussion that Brad's described 30 years ago. But we, if we tried to have it now, we would have to expand what, what I was calling when I was talking to some of you earlier, complicating factors. Missile defense has become a huge thorn in all discussions of strategic stability. During the Cold War, we didn't have that. And we had ground ruled it out through an agreement. Maybe a good idea, maybe a bad idea. That's a whole separate discussion. But it meant that strategic stability was simpler. Cyber didn't exist in, in the kind of capability terms that exist now. That's a huge complication in which I am willing to bet the four of us don't agree. I am positive that the U.S. government doesn't have a coherent view of whether stability is even the right way to talk about it. And I'm even more certain that we and the Russian Federation don't even have the beginning of a common view. So there's a, uh, a complication. Um, space uh, is 
a long-standing issue for the Russian Federation, met with a long-standing, that's silly, you're worrying about nothing response by the United States. But it's getting more complex now uh, because of concerns on both sides with the increased use of space and with uh, the, the concept of space control. So I think that at one level, Brad's right, but I think if you overcame all of the concerns that Brad raised and we got into a genuine, respectful dialogue on strategic stability, it would simply be harder because it's harder among ourselves because it is a more complex world. I think, I think this is a, a useful moment to, to touch again on this escalate to de-escalate thing because it's been super controversial, at least in, in Washington, in terms of whether it's an accurate perception of Russia's actual thinking about nuclear use. And, and a, a way of answering your question is saying, you know, the evolution that I see has to do with the threshold for nuclear use, going up, down, back, and forth, etc. So in the Cold War, there was an expectation that there could be conventional conflict between the Soviet Union and NATO or the United States. If that was going to occur, there might come a point at which one side, more probably our side, given the preponderance of conventional forces on the Soviet side, might have to cross the nuclear threshold. So, so there was a lot of thinking about what that would mean and how we would reduce incentives for that to turn into a full-blown nuclear confrontation. We then had a post-Cold War period, relatively brief perhaps in retrospect, in which there was an expectation that effectively the, the political components of conventional conflict could very well occur. In other words, the alignment of nations and governments on the map might change. Those are things that historically in human history have provoked conflict. But that they would happen more or less without the actual conventional war part of the equation. Why? Because Russia was basically outclassed. Russia didn't have the ability to intervene in those various points on the map. It barely had the, uh, the ability to maintain the integrity of the Russian Federation itself when faced with separatist challenges, for example, in the Caucasus. Um, and now we're in a different, so, so the assumptions that went with that state of the world when applied to a different period, the period we're in now where Russia, in fact, symmetrically or more probably asymmetrically has capabilities with which to respond or even to initiate conflicts beyond its borders is one in which suddenly again we have to go through that type of thought process, not identical, but that type of thought process about where in the political kind of casus belli to conventional actual use of force to crossing of the nuclear threshold, when do we begin to implicate the risks for nuclear escalation? And I think it's in that thought process, to, so to try to answer your question about you know, the reaction between Russian thinking and, and Russian doctrine and American thinking, I think that's where we've started to go wrong because we just haven't been paying attention to the underlying changes that have been happening in Russia for the last 25 or 30 years in terms of the way they think about their interests. And that's why we misread and mislabel, I think, some of the Russian nuclear policy. Sure, I'll just say that to the original question, I think the uh, definition of strategic stability, which is always a challenge, and in our study we've been told we need to put our, our definition right at the beginning, because any book you read, including the one Yasek put out just recently, uh, it's a good idea to say what you think strategic stability is. And traditionally it's been simply minimizing the incentives to strike first using nuclear weapons. That's what I think the U.S. view is, uh, generally speaking. But in Europe, it seems a lot bigger than that. They haven't been thinking about nuclear weapons for many years. They don't want to think about nuclear weapons. And its, it's stability to them is the larger concept that includes economics and political relationships and the, the, uh, the mission of, of a larger Europe and relations with the neighbors and all of that. Uh, this may be part of the problem is that we're not talking about the same term to some extent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Linton, I'd like to pick up on something that you said that intrigued me. Um, you indicated that you didn't think there would be agreement uh, within the U.S. government, let alone on this panel, about um, how new technologies um, 
impact strategic stability and, and how those can be sort of accommodated in a traditional arms control environment. So I'm thinking specifically of you know, hypersonic glide vehicles, cyber, you mentioned space. Um, I'd love to hear the panel's views on, on the ways that those fit into um, perceptions of strategic stability currently in the US and, and how those can be accommodated. Well, I, I think you have to look at two different sets of issues. You have to look at sets of issues where we don't have concurrence because they're really hard. And you, then you've got to look at some other sets of issues where we don't have coherence because we haven't tried, all right? A and then maybe a third class is where we don't have coherence because there's really no there there. So let me give you an example of each of those, um, starting from the last. Hypersonics may be very, very important for a whole bunch of reasons. Nobody has ever explained to me why it alters the risk of nuclear war. Yes, President Putin bragged about now he can deliver ways, uh, in, he can deliver nuclear weapons to the United States in ways we can't stop. And that's true. It was true 10 years ago, it was true 20 years ago, it was true 40 years ago. There's, no, there's nothing there. It's an important technology and maybe a hugely important technology for militaries generally, but it doesn't have anything to do with strategic stability. Example of where something really matters and we haven't thought about it. We have talked in this room this week more about the implication of precision guided cruise missiles on strategic stability than the entire US government has thought about as far as I can tell. Uh, Russians for the last 10 years have said, we're really worried about strategic stability. And they've used those war because of precision guided weapons. And we've heard prompt global strike, which is a program that to be charitable is moving very slowly in the United States. And so we haven't thought at all about something they've been doing everything but writing running billboards to tell us are important. So that's a second class. Maybe when we think about it, we'll discover it's an insolvable problem. I have no idea. But until we start thinking, we won't find out. And then the final one, the first thing, is things that we don't have coherence because they're simply hard. Cyber is hard. What is the difference between trying to find out what's going on uh, through cyber technology and trying to get ready to plant some kind of wonder cyber weapon which we can't talk about because then it's exploiting a vulnerability we don't want anybody to know about. And how does the other side tell? We don't know. Does the concept of strategic stability have any meaning in the cyber world? We don't know. Does the, in, in 46, when guys like Brody were writing about nuclear weapons, we sort of knew that everything had changed, but we didn't know how, and we didn't know what was in the future. We're a little past that in cyber now, but we're not a lot past that. And so I think there are these three different dimensions uh, of truly difficult where we simply need to think more. Maybe difficult we don't know because we aren't bothering to think about it because we keep ignoring what we're told. And by the way, the Russian analog of that is non-strategic nuclear weapons where we keep telling them this is a big deal for the United States and they keep saying nothing. Um, and then finally, a, a category of things which have been, in my view, sort of overhyped prompt global strike, I mean, uh, uh, hypersonics is, is one, but probably not the only thing. I, I'd be stunned if I don't have some objections to the left somewhere. So afraid to hear them. <laughs> Linton's almost certainly right. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've, uh, the, at least the American expert community that's begun to think about these new technologies and their impact has been 
almost preconditioned to, an to the answer because many of the projects are funded under the title of disruptive technologies. Mm -hmm. So if they are by definition disruptive, you have already answered the question that you've set out to inquire about. Uh, and I, th I think there are two basic hypotheses in play, uh, at, in, at least in the national uh, policy debate on this question. Hypothesis one, all of these new forms of competition are destabilizing. Uh, either in a crisis stability framework or an arms race stability framework. Crisis stability. Um, they all reinforce the, the need to go first and hard. If, if you think a war is going to happen and you've got these capabilities and your enemy has them, you'd better use them because they're going to go away. Uh, and if the other guy can use them against you decisively, well, the game's over the, the, as it starts. So crisis unstable and arms race unst unstable. Um, first of all, in these new technology domains, Russia, the United States, and China haven't said, oh gosh, mutual stability and mutual assured vulnerability is the way to go here. No, we've all said we want to dominate. Mm -hmm. Dominate. And in the Cold War, we could monitor an arms race by putting satellites in the sky and counting big things on the ground. How do you know who's ahead in cyberspace? Or even outer space, for that matter? What does it mean to be ahead? So, hypothesis one, bad news for stability. Hypothesis two, um, this only reinforces the unwisdom of going to war. This only reinforces its unpredictability. This only reinforces your expectation that if war happens, you're going to pay a terrible price. Uh, if you're very good at cyber offense, you know there is no such thing as cyber defense. And you are going to be the victim, even if you conduct a first strike. You can't, by cyber means, eliminate the enemy's ability to strip you clean afterwards. Same in space. You operate in space. You go first. You don't know what the consequences are going to be, but they're not going to be good for you, too. So the counter hypothesis is there are so many vulnerabilities that go with competition in these domains that just like the nuclear domain, it is mutual assured destruction, or at least mutual assured vulnerability. So leaders just won't run these risks and just won't go there. And an interesting data point on this is that in uh, war games, uh, which, well, in, in war games, it's very common that political leaders will not engage in the play that's set up for them to play, using these tools to shape a conflict. Too much risk. See, I just I want to support what Brad has said, um, and and I want to just make a, a really, you know, a ten thousand foot elevation kind of point about human nature. So why why does the stock market go through you know extreme highs and lows why do we keep having cycles of kind of overconfidence and bubbles and then collapse and then it all happens over again because every time investors and you could argue that the the, the nation and the world as a whole convinces themselves that it's different this time there's something different there's been some fundamental change and so the thing that we always knew to be true which is that you know offense is always going to dominate right it's just not true this time because we came up with something new and something different and i think the temptation in this period where there are a number of open new doors that are frankly not well understood by anyone outside of relatively narrow circles at least in a technical sense in a sense of capabilities is to presume that in each of these cases there's at least some plausible likelihood and there are a lot of people who are in the where you sit is where you stand sense institutionally interested in convincing people of this fact where the door is open to yeah maybe we actually are going to fundamentally change something about the offense defense balance the difference between this and a relatively relatively slower moving 20th century development of nuclear technologies and in particular of delivery technologies right not so much about like megatonnage as it is about you know the ability to hit stuff and not be shot down in the process is that you know we had a couple of decades of breathing room for the general public and decision makers and Congress and so forth to be persuaded that 
yeah, okay, the logic of, I think you described ballistic missiles brilliantly when you said you sort of shoot it up on a trajectory and the universe decides where it lands, right? That's a pretty fundamental principle. But I think the analog to that in the cyber world, it just doesn't exist. It may, in fact, exist, but it's not widely understood. And so I think a an otherwise rational person, just like all of you and, you know, your your parents and siblings and your grandchildren ad infinitum, otherwise rational, intelligent people will continue to repeat this stock market bubble and collapse mistake because you'll be open to being persuaded that there's something different every time. And I think that that's the, the trap that we're in with, with so-called new technologies today. Which way? Yeah. Can I just make one point? The complicating factor with that, which I agree correctly, is that in history, offense and defense do change. And sometimes we see it coming and sometimes we don't. So the problem here is more complicated then you make it in a world in which technology changes at a faster rate than at any time in human history. You know, I don't think the oceans are going to be transparent tomorrow. I don't think that perfect space-based missile defense is going, to, is going to suddenly trump the offensive power of the ballistic missile. I don't think that... Uh, there is going to be a fundamental change in our ability to apply certain types of offense. Uh, I also negotiated a treaty with the Soviet Union 182 days before the country went away, and I didn't think it was going to go away. So I, it seems to me the problem we have is, is sometime the wolf is actually going to show up, and we have no idea when. Wolf. Um, yes, and my, uh, my list I didn't get to of areas of possible cooperation that some people are in, in the uh, arenas I've been talking to are suggesting is that maybe we can work with Russia on some of these new areas, primarily because of such uncertainty, because we don't know how bad they could be. We don't really know if it's a good idea to develop hypersonic weapons on both sides. Uh, so why not you know, headed off at the pass now, early on. So uh, areas I've heard, I think we mentioned all of them, PGMs, hypersonic, cyber, uh, cruise missile technology, space, we already have a really nice arms control treaty. It's just, you know, at least our side doesn't seem to want to abide by it much longer. So, um, or maybe I'm reading too much into the new Space Force, but, which by the way, as an ex-Air Force officer, I think is ridiculous, but that's a whole different issue. So, there we go. Thanks, Jeff. Um, well, just to pick up on that a little bit, you know, uh, we often hear from the Russian side an interest, and I've talked with Linton a little bit about this already, um, in multilateralizing arms control. And I'm wondering how some of the ideas that you've brought up uh, for cooperation, but then also um, the feedback that you've been getting from other partners uh, shapes your thinking about how possible this would be and whether that would have an impact on strategic stability. Okay. Well, I know you sent us these questions in advance, but I don't have a good answer to this one. Uh, there's real mixed feelings on whether multilateralizing these discussions is a good idea. Uh, for one thing, as we already see in just regular meetings in NATO or the EU, it's nearly impossible to reach consensus on anything because you've got 29 members of one and, and uh, about to grow and 22 in the EU, I think, and 56 in the OSCE. I mean, how do you get countries with such diverse views and interests to come to agreement? And it's a very hard process. Um, so that makes it challenging. Uh, sometimes our adversary may want to have multilateral discussions for various reasons and we're suspicious so we won't agree or vice versa. Uh, goes back to human nature ag again. So I don't have a good answer uh, on that. There is some interest in certain areas of uh, multilateralizing. There's, for example, if we're going to talk about uh, another round, which I don't think we will, but the next round of strategic arms control, uh, it's fairly commonly believed that that would have to be multilateral because we're going down to such low, lo so, such low numbers in the next round that we would be entering the realm where China and France and Britain and Pakistan 
are going to be fairly close to the levels the United States and Russia might have. So it would, for the interest of stability, it would be a good idea to involve everyone in those talks. Um, I'll stop there. Let me, let me venture to say something very definitive on this. No, no, and yes. Uh, no, number one, is if you can't juggle two balls, why would you try to juggle 15? Uh, number two is, from the perspective of the Russian interest, this sort of great power gambit, this sort of door opening of a door to various kinds of dialogue, various tracks of dialogue with the principal adversary of the United States, you know, why would you put the UK at the table, right? That actually diminishes the status and the value of this instrument. And the yes is, yes, but it's really about calling the bluff. And that can be for both sides. So that can be for the United States to say, okay, so the reason, like we all know kind of wink, wink, that the reason you're trying to pull away from INF is because you're concerned about China. Let's get China at the table. Let's deal with this thing, right? It's a bluff calling instrument. Um, the Russians could arguably do the same thing. Uh, they could say, you know, we know you're monkeying around with the fact that there are actually other nuclear powers in Europe that are on your side. So let's get them at the table. Let's deal with this thing. So that would be a I think that's a fair argument for trying to do something that's a limited multilateral. But I think the notion that you get all of the world's nuclear powers around a table and expect it to work any better than any of the other multilateral formats, you know, good luck. Yeah, can I add two points? Uh, one, um, bear, bear in mind Linton's earlier distinction, the, sh the shelling Halperin distinction, between formal arms control and informal arms control. It's difficult to imagine formal arms control becoming, uh, uh, particularly in the nuclear area, nu newly multilateral. Uh, but but if, if the pathway forward is, in, in, in Jeff's list, um, rules of the road, norms, um, just clubs coming together, I mean, we, we don't need every nation in the world to agree to a rule of the road to uh, space and counter space activity. It just has to be the spacefaring nations. Um, so it may be that you create not coalitions of the willing exactly, but the key stakeholders that you bring together to create norms. Uh, and, and that's arms control by one definition and not by another. Uh, the, the other argument, just the, our focus here is on US Russia and the transatlantic security relationship, which is a narrow slice from an American policy perspective of the strategic stability topic. Because we have to look, as we look at Russia, we also have to look at China. And as we look at the transatlantic world, we also have to look at the trans-Pacific world. Uh, and there, there are just to highlight a, a couple of points that might be of interest. One, we have allies in Northeast Asia who have very particular views of strategic stability. Uh, the Japanese under no circumstance want the United States to accept mutual vulnerability as the basis of strategic stability between the United States and China. Their concern is that if we say that, China won't be reassured, it will be emboldened. It will receive the message that America will choose to be deterred when China confronts Japan, and therefore this can't be stabilizing, so why would America do it? It's a very different orientation to, the, to this question of the major power dimension. Um, I, I don't see the next, uh, I, from my perspective, it's possible for the United States and Russia to contemplate an additional bilateral reduction without the participation of any other country. But the country, the, 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 the caveat there is China. No one, no one really expects that Britain or France might regrow their arsenals in the current security environment. Maybe in a very different one somehow they might produce additional nuclear weapons. China's the country that's producing additional nuclear weapons, and it's going up. And already in 2009 it was clear in both Washington and Moscow that we were not prepared to do a new arms control deal below 1550 without some more assurances than we could get, than we had at the time, from Beijing about its likely response. Uh, and thus, the commitment of the Obama administration, like the commitment of the Bush administration, to pursue a strategic stability dialogue with China, to try and lay the foundations for a, a, a Chinese statement of some kind about, well, we're not going to tell you how many nuclear weapons we have, but we've got enough.
at least for the foreseeable future. China just said no. Not talking, got nothing to say, already know everything we ne need to know about your view of strategic stability, uh, and go away. Uh, and that is a real barrier to further arms control reductions by the United States and Russia. It is, it is a three-party game, even if the result isn't a formal three-party agreement. The reason we have multiple panelists is so you can be exposed to more than one idea. Let's get back to strategic stability's basic purpose, preventing nuclear war. All right. Preventing nuclear war is war between two states. Strategic stability, if it has a multilateral dimension at all, it's the sum of a series of bilateral relationships, right? Nothing we do with the Russian Federation will make war with China, a nuclear war with China, more or less likely. These are a series of hard bilateral problems. That's point one. Point two, is my otherwise admirable colleagues have used arms control as a synonym for reductions. Why? I, there is zero benefit to being at 1,000 weapons compared to 1,500 weapons. Those are the same number in the nuclear world. There is a lot of benefit to not knowing to knowing where we are and to being perceived as equal and there's not needing reasons. So arms control is not a synonym for reductions unless you believe that the vision of complete abolition is possible. And then obviously you can only get there by reducing, but, but for purposes of this discussion, except that there are people who are going to live to see that world where abolition is possible, but none of them are sitting up here, uh, except maybe Matt. Uh, the, so I, I think that, that you have to be careful of that. I, I also want to push back pretty strongly on this China thing. China's a red herring, all right? When our gallant Russian allies say we can't work with unless China joins, they know China's not going to join, so it's a respectable excuse to say not do things. Jeff, with great respect, said, you know, getting really close. The United States declared formal stockpile is 4,000 weapons. The highest number you can find in the unofficial literature and the most widely quoted is Hans Christensen of 250 weapons, all right, China. for China. If, if we can't adjust 4,000 because we're getting too close to 250, uh, we need to do a, a little rethinking. I agree it would be hugely politically useful for the Chinese to say publicly that they would not take advantage of further reductions to increase their weapons. I don't know why they're unwilling to say it because I think it's actually their real policy. But I do not accept that either that reductions are necessary or that if they, we decide they're desirable, that we're anywhere near where we have to worry uh, about, about China. I, I think that is an excuse for inaction uh, in at least one and maybe two countries. Thanks, Linton. Um, so I'm going to abuse my prerogative as uh, chair of the session for one more question. And I'm conscious of the fact that we've been charged with discussing both US and Russian perceptions of strategic stability. So I think I'd like to, to wrap up my portion with asking you, where do you perceive the similarities there and where do you perceive the differences? It's a broad question, wherever you'd like to go with it. Matt. Okay, so you, you seem to be looking at me. Um, I, I, think, I think the similarities uh, are in the history. 
overwhelmingly. I, I really think it's true that broadly speaking, you had once you once you get out of the period of um, the the initial race to develop and prove, you know the uh, the actual explosive and the delivery technologies, the basic, uh, you know, uh, uh, atomic weapon, uh, you know, uh, nuclear weapon, hydrogen bomb, and then and then the ICBM delivery and long range bomber and so forth. So let's say by this time we're in the 1960s. Okay, then you have another period uh, of of relatively unconstrained competition. Uh, in terms of numbers. So this is largely a quantitative competition. But once you get out of these two periods of relatively unconstrained competition, you get into a period of what I think of, but you you know, you know, guys experienced this more than, than I did, certainly firsthand, I think of as relatively similar thinking about the problem of strategic stability up to the end of the Cold War. And when you come to the end of the Cold War, that's where thinking diverges radically. And the reason is not rocket science, no pun intended. The, the reason is that the countries are radically differently situated. And I will tell you the, 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 the difference in circumstance that we think the least about, because it's very natural that any one of us tends to have a perspective which um, begins and ends from the stuff that we do all day, every day. So I am a kind of US-Russia guy. Um, but I'm cognizant of the fact that actually most of the peop people around me in Washington, even in the foreign policy establishment such as it is, are not U.S.-Russia people. Um, and so I'm aware, therefore, that the United States, especially since the end of the Cold War, has had more or less 98.7% of the stuff on its agenda have nothing at all to do with Russia. Whereas for Russia, I would argue 50% plus of its foreign policy agenda is about the United States, centered on the United States, reaction to the United States, and so on. That alone, if, if, and I could add another dozen plus factors to this list, but that would be factor number one on the list as to why thinking about both arms control, whether you define it in the way Linton has defined it or the way Jeff has implicitly defined it or any other way, and strategic stability writ large is radically different in the post-Cold War era because of the difference in what I would call global aperture for the United States and Russia. Um. I think everything Matt said is spot on. Um, and I would just elaborate it slightly differently, and that's to say that, um, uh, again, to reiterate an earlier point, I don't think our, our concepts have diverged or changed all that much. I think our, it's our interpretation of what are the threats to strategic stability uh, that, that have diverged because of our different circumstances. But to put a finer point on it, I'd say there were uh, Two evolutions in Russian thinking that we've been playing we've been playing catch up on. Uh, first, the Russians and the Chinese make a distinction between a narrow definition of strategic stability and a broad one. The narrow being arms race and crisis stability, the vocabulary we learned in the 1960s, basically, and the broad one being, <clears throat> in the Chinese language, do we live in a harmonious world? And if we don't, th those challenges to harmony are the sources of instability. And Russia has a different vocabulary to express exactly the same concept. So one difference is they, they went on to think much more about that broader concept of strategic stability than did we. We're still very much rooted, although we're, we're kicking back against the constraints, but rooted in, in the inherited set of concepts. The second main evolution in Russian thinking about strategic stability was in was to shift from the strategic level, all out massive nuclear war against each other and creating the incentives to that not happen, to the regional level, where they perceived a uh, ten foot tall um, uh, unipolar power besotted with its power, uh, dr driven by a highly ideological agenda, whose actions in, in the regions were going to bring to Moscow and Beijing direct threats to the regime, but not because we were marching on Moscow with an army. Uh, and thus, they put their focus on an instability that emerged at the regional level that was strategic because it relates to the survival and the safety and survival of 
their state and regime. Uh, and we've been focused since 9-11 on a different problem set. Uh, both Matt and Brad are absolutely right, and you should have been taking good notes. Sarah asked history. There's another part of history that we need to remember that's more directly related to nuclear confrontation. We have two common perceptions that we need to raise. One is we're both actually terrified of nuclear war. Sometimes we forget we're terrified of nuclear war, but when we think about it, we're really scared of it. And secondly, we both think the other guy is the one who started. It took us a long time to come to that recognition that that's what the Russians thought. Uh, but that's what the Russians thought when they called themselves Soviets, and that's what the Russians think now, that we're the one who is likely to be the instigator or the cause, at least. Uh, and we always thought, you know, we used to be replete with government briefings showing the Soviet commissar getting up and deciding is today to, today to start the war and then whatever your particular strategic hobby horse reaches out with red white and blue on its cuffs and grabs his hand and says not today comrade and um whether that and you laugh um I, I would not name jeff's former service uh as having produced that poster but uh, uh and my former service did it we just didn't do posters we whispered because we're the we, we, we were the silent service but i think we're going to have to deal with that we're going to have to deal with that perception that at a very deep level each of us believes that if there's a nuclear war it'll be the other guy's fault um and that's an enduring problem uh, for which we do not yet have an enduring solution I'll just build on uh, Linton's point that one of the hopes we have that it won't start is that, um, and I guess I'm speaking for us and for the people who develop the policy as well, but it's a very small community in both countries that worry about the nuclear aspects of strategic stability. And by and large, I think they're a very professional group of people who understand the risks and the dangers. and and would recognize and be quite comfortable if we if we knew the language better speaking with our colleagues from the other side and in many cases i felt when i was young and flying on alert and and uh, and pulling missions with nuclear weapons involved that i had more in common with my colleagues on the other side than i did with my relatives back home in the midwest because they didn't understand about they didn't think this and you all are probably starting to pick up on that in your education and these issues today, that you're, this is a different way of thinking. It's a very important, but an issue that most people don't worry about because you can't worry about it all the time. And there are other things going on in life than just worrying about strategic stability. But I'm hopeful that this professional class, if you will, that crosses one would hope all the nuclear nations, but certainly the US and Russia because of our history and our long experience with this, that we can uh, convince perhaps less sensible politicians that might want to start something that it's not a good idea. Can I, can I add a comment? Um, you, you rightly described the, the small community, uh, and I would say it's too small, too isolated, uh, and um, too comfortable. Um, Linton and I regularly have the opportunity to go to Beijing and sit with um, counterparts in a track 1.5 dialogue on uh, nuclear, nuclear dynamics, I think was the title we could agree. Uh, and the first of these dialogues was nearly 20 years ago, also funded by the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. Uh, and, and all the interested Americans and capable Americans who knew anything about the U.S.-China nuclear relationship, all, maybe 10 of us, were, were at the table. And all of the people in China who knew anything about the U.S.-China nuclear relationship and had permission to speak about it, all six of them were at the table. Now, roughly 20 years later, these meetings, the annual meeting in Beijing that we go to, 
Um, there are approximately 60 to 70 Chinese, uh, maybe 25 at the table uh, and the backbenchers. And the leadership says, pay attention to them. They're, they're moving to the front table. Uh, they actually understand your vocabulary of strategic stability, strategic competition, nuclear deterrence, assurance, extended deterrence, blah, 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 all that stuff. Uh, and more than that, they've studied this strategic relationship, and we're ready for this dialogue. And here are Linton and I, and roughly speaking, the same dozen people, because other problems have commanded our attention, and people have been told, and there's something of a taboo, that if you're going to work on nuclear things, you don't, you don't work on this, you work on nonproliferation and disarmament. Uh, and and I think this community has has been uh, somewhat impoverished by its isolation, and this is another mismatch between the circumstances uh, between the United States and these countries. There's a, there's a great deal of new thinking in Russia and China about strategic stability, and a lot of it being done by a younger generation, and, and we're playing catch up there. It seems to me. This moment. I, I was going to say this later, um, maybe in closing, but Brad just set me up perfectly. The three gentlemen uh, surrounding me on this panel, and, and in some sense Monterey um, as an institution, have been exceptional to this. But one of the problems I see in Washington is a very deep gulf between the people who know regions, right? So the people who really know China, really understand, lived in China for a decade plus, whatever, we really have good Chinese, you know, the serious Russia hands. I mean, we exist, right? There are people who are real area studies experts. I'm a weird creature because I also did a bunch of nuclear stuff at Stanford. Um, but generally speaking, one doesn't invite the other's sort of constituents into their caucus rooms. And that has been an enormous mistake. And it is often corrected at the last minute in the form of a sort of quick uh, you know, red pen edit of a document before it goes public. Hey, this is credible, right? The way we're describing Russian thinking, right? It is, right? You know, it's too late to change it, but it is credible. Um, you know, there are exceptions to that. And, and, and my plea, there, therefore, to those of you in the room, whether you're kind of budding uh, regional experts or your nuclear experts, is just do what you can to engage early and often with people on the, you know, from the other silo. Um, because that has really been an enormous problem, and it's one I think we were a little better at during the Cold War, but that's mostly the law of large numbers. There were more of us. Okay, thank you all so much. Um, that was a really rich discussion. So now I'd like to open up the floor, and I'm sure there will be many questions.